Let me start um, with um, a couple of ideas I had in the morning. Why, why, uh, why on earth I suggested this topic to you when we first communicated? And I thought, um, well, since I first uh, went to Britain to pursue um, further studies, uh, one of the things that I realized was the discrepancy between uh, how um, colleagues would see Greece um, in terms of gender and sexuality and how Greeks would see Greeks in terms of gender and sexuality, especially if one wanted to uh, develop an academic analytical agenda around that. Um, to um, make a long story very, very short, uh, all uh, academic colleagues outside Greece would uh, find it very easy to talk about the queerness of Greece in various ways, sometimes in a kind of neo-orientalist way, whereas all Greek colleagues in various ways also would find um, 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 oh, many, many Greek colleagues, uh, or basically Greek colleagues representing institutions, would find ways to undermine any type of concrete um, research agenda that would speak about a gay history of modern Greece or a queer um, um, history uh, and identity of modern Greece or in modern Greece. And that was an interesting issue because if you went to a little bit um, sort of um, scratch uh, that surface, you would see that on the one hand there is a long history, on the other hand the interplay between uh, how you are seen and how you perform is always and has always been there. Uh, the interplay between uh, how one uh, reflects uh, um, their own being Greek or non-Greek and their own being in Greece, as a Greek or non-Greek, was also very much there. If one wanted to write a history of non-normative uh, sexuality in the 19th and 20th century uh, Greece, people have been touched, touching on that, of course, uh, from Byron onwards. Uh, people who have been working on these issues have been touching on that. And uh, I think it is high time we um, went back to that uh, story, to those histories, and also to their interrelations. In previous work, I have have tried to speak about um, writers, um, the inter, um, um, uh, experts um, in Greece um, in the 60s, and also a topic that uh, kind of uh, was um, um, received in um, different ways, let's say, in Greece, uh, Kavafi and the discourses of, of homosexuality and sexuality in general. Uh, in all those cases, I realized um, that um, that is both a very topical, a very political issue, um, and also a very difficult issue to broach. And I'm saying this not simply in order to um, um, sort of um, meet an expectation that some of you might have that Greece is not ready for this type of discussion. It is very ready, and we are having this discussion. I'll get back to that in a moment. But also to a little bit play with that expectation and to tell you that, no, also non-Greeks are not, are not very open to this discussion because it might um, allow us to um, um, get um, into issues to do with um, crypto-colonialism, um, the issue of uh, national identity, nationalism, but also a kind of um, um, the, the, the larger idea of how we see sexuality when it comes to play a role in the diverse aspects of power. Um, it is to those issues that I will return, but of course um, um, this um, um, lecture could not, not have um, 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 not have been under the stress and also within the very context of what happened in Athens a month ago, which is exactly this. Um, you might have heard, and I hope you have heard, of the lynching of activist um, and drag queen Jack Kostopoulos in the center of Athens in mid-day um, um, by members of the public and many other members of the public uh, looking over. Uh, overlooking what eventually uh, was a fatal um, um, a confrontation. Um, it was an issue and it was an event uh, that for many of us uh, meant the loss of somebody we knew, somebody we respected very much, but also a loss of a little bit of ourselves in that it was uh, um, ourselves who believed that we had uh, we had um, um, gone over that aspect of killing homophobia. I mean, we hadn't, and uh, um, uh, events such as these um, uh, uh, made us painful and do make us always painfully aware. 
um, you might have been aware or you might yourselves have been part of the gr huge um, um, mobilization that came after that lynching and uh, saw Athens uh, filled with demonstrations, but also saw a, a, an opening of discourse uh, to address once again what it means to have gender identity play a political role, but also to take gender identity and use it as a springboard to do history and to perform what we call intersexual intersectionality, uh, which is the ways our identities intersect, play a role, and also inform one another. Um, it is to this recent mobilization that this talk is dedicated, even though, and, and somehow I believe I um, offer analytical ways to approach it, even though directly I'm not in the written text that's coming um, out of a piece that is uh, forthcoming in the Journal of Greek Media and Culture in the special issue that we co-edited with Vasily Gikolokotroni, even though I'm not um, gonna talk about um, Zach Kostopoulos and what happened last month, somehow I believe analytically I uh, engage um, with ideas that might be uh, useful in approaching also what happened recently. So this is where um, the proper paper starts. Afterwards, I'm sure there would be panic. But for the moment, in the car, there is risk. There is desire and expectation. The last glance in the car's mirror, checking the makeup, the hair, the way the blouse folds, checking if there is anyone approaching. This is cruising in a working class area in the outskirts of Athens, Zyofra, just outside Athens, Attica, February 2016. Of course, I'm not sure whether it happened exactly like this, but I need to picture the scene as I'm making it up here. I need to start with this reconstruction of cruising, desire, and the possibility of sex in public as a necessary antidote to the toxic description that Greeks read in their newsfeed in the first days of February 2016. The description went like this. A 35-year-old man, occasionally employed as a driver in the children's hospice, the child's smile, to hamogelo to pediu, quote, was apprehended on Tuesday dressed in women's clothes. A resident of the area found him in his car wearing women's clothes and a fake bra sick. Other residents were immediately alerted and trapped the man until agents of the police special force which is in Athens um, called, um, not ironically, Dias, uh, force, Zeus, arrived on the scene. The young man, quote, got frightened and tried to escape. In the end, he was arrested. The report, not without a certain sense of anticlimax, ends by informing readers that, according to our correspondent, after a search of the, women, of the man's house, his questioning by police and other investigations, he did not appear to have had any links with child abuse, neither was there any other evidence of wrongdoing. Having said that, all this had been going on for two days, like all those news reports, right? In a string of reports following the first one, readers were assured, uh, sorry, the readers were assured by the director of the Child Smiles Hospice that the man in question was only employed part-time as a driver. He never came into contact with the children, the director hastened to add. The employee would, of course, be dismissed with the media effect, he said. As further reports suggested, the man whose main job was to carry chocolates and other junk foods that supermarkets offered to the children's hospice may also have been keeping some of the provisions for himself and storing them in his car and house. Finding these after finding him in drag and thinking that they were bait for victims seems to have triggered the investigation for child abuse in the first place, place and the newspaper leaks. So they thought they had found something there because they found chocolates in his car, right? And also because they found him in drag. Cross-dressing may not be legal in Greece, but moral panics and homophobic profiling are still widespread. Interestingly, after two or three days of intense media exposure, the issue dried up. 
even though the Union of Greek Transgender People, SEED, and a number of other activist organizations made announcements criticizing the role of the police on this occasion and urging for the man's privacy and his rights as a worker to be respected, the public was not informed about the way in which this incident was pursued and how it ended. Was this a setup in the first place? Was the man summarily dismissed from his job because of this unfortunate confrontation with the inhabitants of Zofria and the police? Did he face a dismissal panel? Were all proper procedures followed in his contact with the police, media, and the employers? What are proper procedures today in a country like Greece and on an occasion like this? That the protagonists of this incident chose to keep it a private matter and not to come forward to get help from specialists, that the man in question, that is, chose not to come and protest is unsurprising. Indeed, the event in Joffre I've been describing to you, the eventual shaming of the main person trapped during its unfolding, and his later decision to let it remain a private matter despite the help offered by support groups is indicative of the arrangements around gender and sexuality in a country where these issues have a tradition of being considered of a private rather than public nature. As I have argued in more detail elsewhere, in order to assess queer expression and the challenges it faces in contemporary Greece, but also in order to do a history of queer Greece, one needs to take into account a difficult genealogy, a past characterized by the lack of public visibility for queer cultures, the lack of proper debate around issues of gender and sexuality, and the rel relative absence of a visible archive of non-normative uh, non -normative sexual expressions in the Greek public sphere. These have all been interrelated issues that for decades, especially in the 80s and 90s, were responsible for a widespread climate of suspicion against any emerging queer political expression too. That is, because there is not a queer archive out there, and um, we might wish to discuss how the gender archive has also been uh, in the public arena, um, queer political expression is also undermined. All these are issues still active, at least in some quarters. In Greece, the queer often vanishes, as in the case I've been describing to you, not only after being exposed through a shaming machine and being the object of <coughs> institutionalized homophobia, the queer vanishes also as a political subject, demanding rights, voice, and public presence. This is, it would be fair to say, a situation that has been changing in recent years. Queer activism since 2000 has been more visible, visible much more visible, and perhaps more successful than ever before. I'm not saying that everything ha happened and started in 2000, far from it. But I'm saying that since um, um, the first decade of the 21st century, things have been, let's say, more organized. Gay prides in most big cities are multiplying, and the central ones in Athens, Thessaloniki, and Patras have expanded, being supported after some initial hesitation by their municipalities and central uh, governmental agencies. A host of more radical collectives have also formed, often providing a critique of the assimilative politics of the even um, um, the more mainstream gay organizations, while also working alongside them on central issues. And since 2015, from where the picture comes, important pieces of legislation supporting LGBTQI rights have passed in Greece, in most cases with bipartisan support. Law 4356 of 2015, introducing same-sex partnership, was voted by the Greek parliament in December 2015, becoming the cause of celebration and of this, I believe it was from then, um, but also a platform for renewed public visibility from the country's queer activist groups as well as the country's queer past. This is for those, and oh, this is from the jubilation after the... This one is for those who lived and died hunted. Read the editorial of Greece's most popular free press and news website, LIFO, on 22nd of December 2015. 
the day the partnership bill passed in the Greek parliament. The main illustration of that article was the photograph of Andona, a cross-dressing man photographed in the public toilets of Omonia Square sometime in the 1980s. Andona had been one of those legendary pictures of Athens that I remember everyone referring to when I was growing up. Another one was Fteru, the feather she-man. Queer men, often in drag, who would make their presence visible and became known for their acerbic humor, but also for the abuse they had undergone during their life, visible on the body, visible also in that photograph of Andona that illustrated the editorial of Popular Life for magazine in December 2015. This is the legendary Andona, writes Stathis Tragarusianos in that magazine. This is the legendary Andona in the old toilets of Omonia Square. She would not have imagined that some years later the partnership bill would be voted. The only thing she knew was beatings and bullying. She was preordained to live outside the society of the good people. One cannot but think today of the thousands who, like Andona, were submitted to unmeasurable and repeated violence without the possibility that they deserved something better ever to have come to have crossed their mind. That is Stacia Garciano from that editorial. It is obviously uh, intriguing that the scene with which I started this presentation happened just outside Athens, not before, but two months after the partnership bill and its celebrations and positive press and uh, the, the public buildings in, 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 in the colors that you saw. In the event in Zofria, and also in the poli police profile that, uh, to an extent, produced the media event that covered it, in the event in Zofria, we have someone being hunted, just like Andona had been hunted for decades in the past, within the same economy of violence, homophobia, and abuse that is described by the life of editorial now as a characteristic of a bygone era. Since from this perspective, the old photograph in the jubilant editorial is not only about being hunted, but also about being haunted. Antona's image haunts the jubilation for the partnership bill as its queer and defaced past, but is itself also haunted by the trauma of the marginalization and violence it signifies being replicated, even at the moment of it being declared a thing of the past. What I'm trying to describe is, of course, much more general. And one of the underlying arguments of this presentation relates to the ways contemporary neoliberal precari precarity intensifies these moments of double haunting, as it also propels the need for radical historical projects that would take them into account. Risky and overgeneralizing as it might be, it is also analytically productive to keep in mind a global political economy of gender and sexuality where legislation and public recognition make advances celebrated as progress in many parts of the world and in the global public sphere and new media, yet at the same time, and often in the very same locations, homophobic, ethnophallocentric, and homonationalist apparatuses work to undo, sometimes in spectacular ways, these achievements. In Greece, after, and I'm talking about everywhere, <coughs> including, for instance, the US, or everywhere. We are all there. We're in it together. In Greece, after the 2015 partnership bill, an even more radical set of legislative initiatives of sex and gender identity, including the right of same-sex partners to child fostering and the right of transgender people to self-identification in public documents, as well as other provisions against racist and homophobic violence have also made it into law, not without resistance, but always eventually being passed. New collectivities also have made their presence felt in the public domain. From the pride committees of the big cities 
to seize the union of transgender people, to lower the lesbian group, so, group of Athens and other many lesbian um, um, collectives, to trans T and Thetikiphoni, positive voice, the Athens Museum of Queer, Queer Arts, the uh, well-known Amoka, the Thessaloniki collectives, more of Cafeneo and homophobia, the various committees against racism and homophobia that have sprung up it, with impressive consistency and interconnectedness all over Greece since 2010 at least, and of course many much earlier. Moreover, the claiming of public space and the presence in the public sphere becomes increasingly a central issue in LGBTQI political mobilization, an evidence of which was the last Pride slogan, I'm present, Ime Parusa, has persistently attacked the issue of presence in the public space. Sorry. But what I want to draw attention to as my first tentative argument is that all this political mobilization is happening alongside or rather together with a strengthening of homophobic cultures and incidents of violence, a strengthening of a very specific and dominant discourse that precisely undermines the possibility of gender and queer political pres presence as too identitarian, too narrow, too enclosed in its own, own agenda and too extreme at the very at the very same time as homophobic violence makes itself once again felt. I'm not saying that these two are of the same nature, but I'm saying that an easy acceptance that this is too politically narrow that has been going on in Greece, and I'm here kind of glossing a much larger, longer part um, that has been going on in Greece for a long time, is now sitting uneasily perhaps, but is sitting together with a surge once again in homophobia, ethnophallocentric um, discourse and racism. The second argument I want to make is related to this shadow, perhaps, shadowy presence of anti-feminist and anti-queer discourses and how they work with um, new racism and new homophobia. And this second argument has to do with our own critical dispositions and vocabularies. It is precisely because of the return of the undead homophobia and gender violence in today's context that we need to return to today and update our political and critical vocabularies to keep considering their contemporaneity, or in other words, keep doing what Judith Butler has called for since the early 90s, to remain critically queer. To keep considering, that is, who is represented and who is excluded? What kinds of policies are enabled by what kinds of usages and which background, which are, which are backgrounded or erased from view? It is precisely because we see this consistency of anti-queer, anti-feminist discourses and this surge in violence related to gender that we have to reclaim our vocabularies and see how we can make them address the current situation. This is something that is happening in Greece recently with an inventiveness and with an inventiveness that is worth acknowledging once more. It is evident in the rise of courses, debates, and the public profile radical gender theory has seen in Greek academia. And um, some of the people who have been responsible for this are here, and I'm very moved mm -hmm. that they are. It is also evident in the new collectivities, the publishing ventures that have sprung up in recent years, some of which I have just mentioned, and others which you can find online very easily. Many of them were visible in the mobilizations with which I started. What energizes these collectives, these collectivities, this new um, discourse, uh, these new programs in the universities, this new critical mobilization in Greece, is the realization that the common thread of precarity and vulnerability can make us not only organize resistance, but also rework our theoretical, political, and historiographical agendas to include the constant haunting by that other who is denied a place at the very moment one is finally allowed one. Because you see, it is very easy to say that, you know, this is the moment where everything is won, 
Uh, the partnership bill might be the evening when everything is well and suddenly won and suddenly you realize that no, uh, one of us is still being haunted and hunted. Right? And then um, something more is won, and then you realize that some of us are still being hunted down. And then you realize that there's nobody who has mentioned, I don't know, the plight of the refugees and uh, the issues of gender there. And then you realize that then there's something else that's coming up. It is uh, that reason, among so many others, that you need to have your critical vocabularies open. And it is with this in mind that I want to turn to a set of questions that I will address in the second part of this talk. I know it's difficult to see how the connection, what the connection of these two parts are, but believe me, there is. The set of questions I wanted to address in the second part of this talk are, how can one do the history of queer culture in the specific national context and in a historical juncture that, like that of today in the world in, and like that of today's Greece? How can one turn to the past while being pushed, like Walter Benjamin's angel of history to the future. How is this so important in the effort to address current oppression and homophobia? What is the model in which we could turn to tell our stories, but also express our thirst for history? What is the model that would do justice to today's intersectional challenges, while also keeping the record of the past in both its identitarian and its more fluid desire and act-based expressions? What form might such histories take? How can one do the history of modern Greek homosexuality and how can one do it as an engaged, intersectional and contemporary political project? This is, uh, should have uh, part of this kind of uh, new, um, new collectivities that I've been talking about. So this is part two of this presentation and it will be shorter. This is how not to do the history of modern Greek homosexuality. Recent political mobilization has created the need, of course, for a stable and reproducible historical narrative. It always does. In central pride events, for instance, collectivities distribute pamphlets with an indicative chronology of Greek LGBTQI events. One that was produced and debated in Athens Pride 2018 includes the opening of the first gay bars in Plaka in 1976 as a beginning of mobilization. The eventual opening of more bars and queer spaces in the 1980s as important steps. Police raids that created moral panics in the 2000s as events of consciousness raising. And then it celebrates as milestones the first organized Athens Gay Pride in 2005 the proliferation of homosexual publications and collectives by the uh, knots and the gay prides outside Athens, the legal recognition of partnership, of homo partnership, the expansion of today's LGBTQI collectives and associations in the whole country. This is of course a linear narrative and I do not want to underestimate this historiographical mapping or the performative context in which it happens. They are both extremely productive. However, Today, perhaps more than ever, one realizes that producing such a history also entails working through its opposite. It means also finding the ways to show the various articulations with the radical feminist movement, a story that is often absent in these accounts, precisely because there has not been an adequate, adequate historicization of this coexistence. It means finding ways to underline the reasons it is not and should not be taken as a unidirectional itinerary of liberation. It also means finding the ways to show the, the not always unproblematic intersection of the LGBTQI movement with the anti-racist and the feminist movements. So um, to produce this linear history often has the problem that you leave so much out, and this out is important, especially if you take it from um, today's context. Proposing an LGBTQI chronology in Greece today means therefore underlining that the, move, the moment such a chronology is put together and distributed is not the time of freedom, looking back at the subjugated images of the past, but a complex engagement and continuous struggle. How can these histories of liberation also include forms of reflection on their contemporary undoing? 
How can they also include a critique of homonationalist rhetoric that may even help or produce their circulation? How can we narrate the untold gay histories and at the same time re-energize their critically queer potential? Now, um, this is an important uh, moment, and it's an important moment to also address uh, something that might be in the minds of some of you. Um, it is very interesting to pose this question to an audience that often has found uh, the link between ancient Greek homosexuality liberating and then came to Greece and realized that this is not liberating at all in Greece and for Greeks. And unless you're ready to produce this kind of complex question of how to do a history of queer expression in a country and see exactly the different ways that uh, different expressions are articulated um, that you do not get to a point of understanding uh, both the difficulties but also different ways that expressions have happened. An argument often made in Greek queer studies in various forms is that especially between there has been no stable and acceptable concept of a homosexual past in, um, in Greece and acknowledged in the public sphere and the, by the Greek state, a certain traditional and belated narrative of identity-based gay, histo gay history can still go on in Greece while you also uh, keep undermining the various, uh, the various aspects of it and the various um, bases uh, that is doing a queer destabilization. Um, for this reason, queer and gay in Greece have been going on together for quite some time and there have been at least two historiographical projects that we have learned to see um, 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 as coterminous, as g uh, working together. One that tries to argue that in order to understand um, non-normative sexuality in Greece, one has to realize that things did not go on kind of in a, a kind of concrete identity-based um, performance, right? Um, let's call it th that the argument, we have always been queer. Um, Greeks uh, have always found ways, the argument goes, of being different and uh, there have always been ways of uh, people kind of expressing that in various moments, talking about the modern Greek state at least, from the 19th century onwards, and this has been happening. We have to find different analytical vocabularies uh, to understand that. That's the one historiographical uh, project. I no, tend to call it, we have always been queer. Um, then, at the same time, there is another project that you might also be aware of, which is that uh, there have been moments of um, important identity-based performances, even in Greece. Um, all of those of us who have been working on, uh, say, uh, artists from the past, um, or specific uh, um, writers in various uh, uh, forms. Um, you know, my work on Kavafi, for instance, tries to argue um, for a gay Kavafi, really. Um, try to do this. Uh, this is an argument I often um, uh, call uh, there have always been gays. So the um, uh, kind of two historical Graphical projects, we have always been queer in Greece, but in a different way, and there have always been gays, but we couldn't see them very well, um, have been working together uh, so far. And uh, there's, um, in my published work, uh, kind of I'm trying to set out these two camps that are intersecting, of course, but have been there. You know, we have always been queer, there have always been gays, yes. Uh, these two distinct types of inquiry, though, perhaps. It is high time now, and given everything I've been telling you about, to be reconsidered, not only as complementary or intersecting. In today's crisis capes, these projects are not just there in parallel, but they may be keeping each other in check. They are themselves haunted by each other. Talking about those queer and fluid practices of the Greek past where everything was possible if you went to the public square and you were a little bit in the lookout for something, if especially if you were coming, you know, it's kind of, you have so many tourists' accounts, uh, you know, that say that. Talking about all of this, locating their archives, the archives of a different sexuality that was out there and their complex histories of surreptitious emergence is no longer enough if we fail to take into account the complex effacement of these histories, the denial of sexual citizenship and identity expression that they were met with in specific moments, by specific institutions, with specific results in shaping attitudes, official policy, and people's lives. 
It's one thing to celebrate, uh, just sorry, I'm taking into account the, uh, um, um, possibly uh, the audience here, um, um, to, to, to celebrate um, um, Meryl's lover, you know, but, but those of you who are well versed in, uh, in uh, American literature might well know that, all the lovers uh, of Meryl. Uh, okay, yeah, it was possible in Athens. But it's quite another thing to start thinking about whether these people were, uh, were at all had the possibility to sort of have a political engagement with sexuality. Also, whether there were uh, all, all sorts of new Orientalist discourses in uh, recognizing them and desiring them there. And uh, it was all kept at that. So that's why I'm saying these two projects are uh, haunting. I mean, that project of We Have Always Been Queer is haunted here by this idea that where are the gays? You know. On the other hand, it is one thing um, to it is one thing to celebrate a culture of sexual fluidity in a Greece before sexual identities, or to critique the culture of concrete coming out as a Western conceptual framework that cannot stand as the sole benchmark of liberation. Then, but it's something quite different to also realize that these non-identitarian and hidden queer pasts of which Greek culture indeed has plenty, were marked through by the impossibility to develop into anything other than diffuse and hidden. That they were marked by the violent barring of any space where political subjectivity could be claimed on their basis. At the same time, trying to do the opposite and unearth gay identity and queer citizenship emergence in the Greek past runs the risk today of creating a cleansed, whitewashed, stable history of gay emergence that could possibly support homonormative, if not homonationalist agendas and undermine the ability of queer politics to address the contemporary intersectional demands of queer subjects in extreme precarity. That is, uh, it, it's kind of um, another thing then to start saying, okay, let's find the moments of more concrete gay, gay lesbian expression in the past and not address the, uh, the possibility that this was not enough that there were other ways of dealing with that. So a radical historiographical project has to take both this into account, but also show how they're interrelated. And I believe new artists, such as, for instance, um, the work of Marius Hadziprokopiou, Vasilis Noulas, the film directors, Konstantin Yanaris, Panos Kutras, many other film directors that have come after them on their path, the auto-archival projects of Translange and Paula, the archival performances of collectives that you one can see in Amoka, QV, Terminal 119, Mavili Movement, and others, actually have tried to address exactly that issue. How to further organize this into a more concrete historiographical project? Do I have five minutes I need? Four or five minutes, yeah? How to further organize this into a more concrete historiographical project still remains a question for many of us in Greece. And I can here only provide another heuristic answer coming from my own work in a specific case study. And with this, I will close. In recent years, I have been drawn time and again to a brilliant insight in Lauren Berlant's magisterial The Queen of America Goes to Washington City, her concept of diva citizenship. It does not solve uh, the riddle of how to do the history of modern Greek homosexuality, of course, but it urges to, to untie knots, to work cultural texts and historical inquiry together, and to scan for moments of subaltern emergence in the past that are worth analyzing, querying, and re-expressing. Diva citizenship is precisely a moment of spectacular emergence that demands to be taken seriously. And scanning the past for moments of subaltern emergence becomes a deeply critical historical project in that it shows in the present the ease with which sexual subalterns' bodies, their social labor, and their sexuality are exploited, violated, and saturated by normalizing law, capitalist prerogative, and official national culture. This is how Berlin thinks of diva citizenship, basically, that moment when somebody comes out and says, I exist. And then, of course, you don't know whether it will be taken up. You don't know whether it will create a difference. But it has happened. Keeping this analysis in mind, which I'm not reading, I return to a familiar scene of the recent Greek past, but this time taken from a fictional setting. It comes from a film that has produced public debate 
and arguably a change in attitudes towards trans and queer visibility in Greece in recent years, calling on people to rethink citizenship, history, belonging, and political urgency. Towards the end, sorry. Oh, hello. Towards the end of the film that has her as its protagonist, Strella, leaves her lover in a fully, Athenian ho fully lit Athenian hotel. It's of course Christmas and Athens is lit. The Acropolis, heavily featured in the previous scene, is behind her. Tragedy has been a, a little bit of archaeology there. Yeah. The, archae the Acropolis you don't see, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, you see it in, in the film if you ever get to see that film, Strella. So the Acropolis <laughs> is in the previous scene to that and is behind her as it is now. Um, um, the camera, uh, and she starts this kind of long night walk in the center of contem con contemporary Athens. The camera focuses on Strella with medium shots that track the city as they follow her steps, while Maria Callas dominates the soundtrack. Even though in many ways a scene of liberation, this is also a scene of a complex haunting. At the level of narrative, the film is haunted by the difficult pattern that kinship, abuse, desire, and the archives of the past always make in their intermingling. But in the larger context of the film, this walk of a transgender sex worker played by the real life transgender uh, artist Mina Orfanou in the center of Athens and on the screen of national representation was decisively also haunted by the many other scenes of trans people forced into and or erased from the public scene in the past. Within the film narrative, but also with its potential to break out of it, this was exactly what Berlin calls diva citizenship, an exodus into the public space, a demand made in the public sphere. Strella, A Woman's Way, as you can find it in English, in, uh, directed by Panos Kutras in 2009, Nine is a new queer melodrama that engaged audiences from its first release, a story of a trans woman sex worker who first decides to avenge and then falls in love with the father who once killed her own lover, it created a debate on trans queer representation in Greece from the outset and has become a strong cultural reference point thanks to its ability to elicit complex political and gender insights. The way uh, Butler and Athanasiou discuss this film is, has been very influential here. Here, focusing on the film's last scenes, I want to further flesh out, as my last point, two of its most intriguing diva citizenship characteristics. First, the complex temporal relation it developed with its specific sociocultural context. And second, its potential to bring with it, to retrieve other similar reimaginings of the public space, other previous moments of diva citizenship that may have lost momentum, gone astray, or been forgotten in the previous decades. I will explain both of them briefly. First, Strella's queer temporalities. You see, as it tells its story of emergence into the public space, that public space, that film made us confront the public space it showed and what was happening there. It was 2009, but you see it today and you realize what, how much ha has happened in there since. Somehow, it is in that space that all the public confrontation that was involved with what has been called the Greek crisis happened. Somehow, it was there that all these new collectivities, also those that I have been talking about, made themselves felt. Somehow, it was there that all the mobilization after uh, the, after the um, um, almost assassination of activist Konstantina Kuneva um, um, happened. All these, all these mobilizations that also so include mobilization about um, uh, refugees, mobilizations, of course, about um, um, living in precarious situations in Greece, but also the recent mobilizations that I started with. It is that space, and here, of course, I'm talking about, I'm sorry, to, um, and in 2009, critics may have celebrated the success of Strella as the victory of a progressive 
modern nuclear Greece over a traditionalist, patriarchal and homophobic past. I was one of those, actually. Yet it was very soon that in the, and in the urban setting in which Stella walks at the end of her film that the rising power of the neo-fascist Golden Dawn Party, for instance, made itself felt in violent attacks against migrants, queers, and unionist activists. Or that neo-nationalist movements in that very space expressed their anger against austerity in a neo-macho rhetoric that did not hide its hatred for anything falling outside the idea of traditional family values. Watching it today, one, one cannot underestimate how, in a queer time reversal, Strella is imprinted with the phantom of an uneasy political future. Something is going to happen here when you see it today. As its protagonist comes out and walks outdoors in the final scenes of the film, the intersectionality of her demands, a trans woman out in public space Athens in 2009, previously implied within the film's narrative, now becomes more pronounced and more related to the public space she traverses as you see it and receive it today. These images, as they are watched and rewatched today, are imbued with what came afterwards. The picture of that space is now indelibly marked by the fact that it would become the theater of an intense and agonistic intersectionality for so many people in the years after the film, and the proof that the battle against forms of racism, exclusion, and violence is open-ended. And if that was Strella's queer temporalities, the second point I want to, um, to underline in this kind of moment of diva citizenship is the retrieval of past divas. In classic diva citizenship mode, Strella also dragged along not only its agonistic future, as I said just a moment ago, but also a similarly demanding past, a difficult genealogy, voices from the queer and trans past that had made its own present possible. Lecturing on the new queer aesthetics of the film in 2010 and 2011, I myself was confronted with these other stories, often in the form of audience questions or often by people wanting to speak out, share old histories, and take a stance. An archive of the past was emerging again, calling on us to retrieve possibilities, probabilities, potentials. The scenes from Strella were used as a catalyst in order to remember, for instance, those trans women sex workers who had appeared in Athens in the 70s and 80s and had tried to claim public space, voicing radical but eventually disavowed demands about sexual citizenship. It all happened then in 2009. Suddenly all this past was coming out in a new force. A classic gay history of Greece would catalog those old instances as relics from the past, a prehistory of today's successful queer movement. However, seeing them in the context I describe urged us to reconsider them as diva citizenship events too, and to focus on how they had endured, how they faltered, how they could eventually be remembered and remembered and revisited as political performances in contemporary Greece, picked up by difficult agents and claims. We were thus forced to take into account diverse temporalities and contours, survivals and capitulations, moments of emergence and histories of resilience. It is with that image of Strella in mind or perhaps uh, behind one back in a PowerPoint that I was confronted one again and again and we were all confronted with the story of trans activist Paola Revegnotti and the fanzine she had edited and published herself in the 1980s. You read it today, you realize how, what I mean by retrieving past moments. It was then that we realized Paola's and, and Paola herself, which can be seen here, I mean this is um, Paula herself um, <clears throat> was herself an activist in many ways. This is the uh, fanzine she edited in the 80s, but also this is kind of part of a series of photographs that she made in the 70s and 80s and were available. And suddenly we were becoming more and more uh, aware of those and people were more and more interested in that past, right? And uh, it is very interesting that if you think about it, even that photograph of Andona that I started with came from her archive. 
Okay. Um, and it is also um, in, in, with that image in mind, with that new kind of um, 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 sort of film, that we also came to celebrate another trans activist of the 1970s and 80s, also very related to, the, to what was then the queer activist group, Betty, and you can see her here in three different, uh, um, uh, this is in a film from, the, from 1979, 1980, and then uh, Betty now, and then Betty in a performance um, that was very interesting two years ago, uh, a year ago in Athens, uh, where she kind of interjects uh, in a performance of another um, uh, play, and she interjects uh, playing this kind of figure um, who uh, every time she comes on scene, and this is Betty, the old activist, um, who by the way has also a role in that film I've been talking about, Strella. Uh, every time she comes on scene, um, on stage, she delivers another monologue about violence. And you don't know how it came about. This is called the Marada. It is, uh, that photograph comes from there. Um, um, and every time, every time, every time she comes on stage, there's another story of violence that ends with death. You, I, I mean, nothing else. And that was last year, unfortunately, a little bit kind of engaging with this type of time reversal that I've been also trying to engage in today's um, lecture. All these moments, real life political accounts of oneself, fictional scenarios or their in-betweens, cannot anymore be seen as exercises in postmodern playfulness or complex identity games, um, sorry, this is, um, uh, or complex identity games in a country where identity is always at stake and its politics often questioned. What I've been arguing is that they are, most crucially, exercises of historical retrieval and archival reappropriation, projects directly evolving from and revolving around moments of diva citizenship and able today to reorganize radical archives of belonging, demanding, and political mobilizing. Diva citizenship, seen through these examples, is an assortment of such moments of intersection between past, present, and future that demand to be taken as a genealogical exercise. And of course, with genealogical, here I mean something more than trying to find your parents. This, in practice, means a demand for a history of the present, one that foregrounds our intersectionality as present continues, our need for historicization as present archival, our citizenship claims as present processual, and our multi-layered precarity as present biopolitical. And in conclusion, what we have understood very well in recent years in Greece is that the relationship between past and present is neither singular nor unidirectional. In other work, I have called this more general feeling archive trouble. It is precisely the exigency and urgency of the present moment, including the present of queer activism in a fast-changing and precarious Greece, that makes so evident the ways it is haunted by the unfinished histories, the unclaimed territories, and the untold stories of the past. Within this larger context, Greece today has become a vantage point from which to see the demand for homosexual history not as a parallel undertaking to contemporary queer politics, but as its inescapable yet productive hauntology, and vice versa. History, history writing, and history making to be seen not as linear, a linear project, but as a queer project that sits uneasily with the narratives of national, cultural and social belonging mobilized today to frame the subjects of crisis and the constitution of crisis capes. Our current predicament requires queer histories in the present to remain both critical and haunted. And this means, among other things, that it requires queer histories in the present to fight in order to keep their claims as open processes, open towards their historical narrative and archival meddling, the political inclusivity of their demands, and their relationship to their future undoing. 